Well, good morning. It's Sunday, April 5th, 2020. And uh, we just need to talk a little bit today about God being in control, no matter how chaotic your world may be. Now, oftentimes when your world is chaotic, you need a little jocularity or a little humor to take it with a grain of salt, so to say. Another word would be levity. As Robert Louis Stevenson said, nothing like a little judicious levity. And levity is humor or frivolity. And it's especially the treatment of a serious matter with humor or in a manner lacking due respect, which some people may think, yes, this is not appropriate, but oftentimes we need that break in the seriousness of a situation. So I just thought I would share a few humorous, um, funny anecdotes about this whole situation that we're in with COVID-19. Um, the big thing is the whole toilet paper thing. If it follows like it's been going, uh, the richest woman in the world would uh, be bartering with toilet paper. And as the other little photo, desperate times call for sticky, desperate measures. And uh, that is kind of an oddity of the whole thing. Or Chick-fil-A's new uh, <laughs> new advertising campaign. Uh, it speaks for itself there. And speaking of essential and non-essential, well, if they followed their train of thought, the government would accidentally shut itself down with a ban on non-essential businesses, which uh, <laughs> would be appropriate in this situation. And teachers urge the government to re reopen schools before students learn to think for themselves. So true. Um, our public schools have turned into centers of indoctrination. And quarantine journalists really starting to annoy family by calling them racist all day. And uh, that seems to be the ongoing thing words like racist, xenophobic, homophobic, that's all you hear. And here's here's a fun one. Um, fooling thousands of readers in a prank that the cable news organization said was just for fun, CNN published a real news story for April Fool's Day this year. <laughs> and if only they did that in reality. Baffled CNN fans immediately knew something was up. And then we have our fun little stimulus package. And of course, stimulus, you define it, it's an event, sensation or experience that causes you to react. And that's the idea behind a stimulus package to cause the economy to well, overall, Americans are excitedly anticipating getting paid with their own money, which truth of the matter is, it's our money anyway. But in reality, you think about it, it's not even our money, it's God's money. And Congress busily is working at coming out with a new design for the Benjamins there, $100 bills. And uh, actually that picture above there is actually a picture from Congress some time back. Shows you how hard they do indeed work. Well, enough said on that stuff. Let's get into the reality of the world we're living in. And all I wanna say is God is in control. A verse from the book of Job says, in whose hand is the life of every living being? and the breath of all mankind. So it's a question posed. Whose hands are we in? Well, we're in God's hands, believers and non-believers alike. 
grace as we know it is special and it's also common. When it rains, it rains on the just and the unjust. As Corey Ten Boom said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. And as Christians, that is our joy. And Alistair Begg said, all of the ebb and flow of history is to be viewed in light of the fact that there is a throne in heaven. And that throne is not empty. It is occupied by God and God is in control. So this is all looking at the overarching theme of the sovereignty of God. But what we see in our everyday activities is a little different. So looking at a definition for the sovereignty of God, subject to none, influenced by none, absolutely independent, which is the truth of God. As A.W. Pink says, God does as he pleases, only as he pleases, always as he pleases. None can thwart him, none can hinder him. So sovereign means one who exercises supreme authority and rule. And we use that word in a finite sense talking about the sovereignty of nations. But the sovereignty of God means the supreme authority and rule of God. But then it breaks down to a, another level, I guess you could say, when we look at the providence of God. And divine providence is the governance of God by which he, with wisdom and love, cares for and directs all things in the universe. So the doctrine of divine providence asserts that God is in complete control of all things. He is sovereign over the universe as a whole, as in its entirety. As Psalm 103, 19 says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. And that rule is over the entire universe. And then as Matthew 5, 34 to 36 says, and this is Jesus um, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, which Psalm 103 addressed, or by the earth, for it is his footstool. So this right here, the earth. It is his footstool. It basically means it's subordinate to God or by Jerusalem. Now it's breaking it down even further, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you can't, cannot make one hair white or black. And that just refers to our inability to truly alter what's happening in the world. Um, we can cause things to take breaks or to ease, you know, just mainly how medications work, they ease symptoms, but there's never an ultimate cure because we all still die eventually. So the physical world, that's the entirety of the earth as we know it is under God's providence. And then Psalm 66, he rules forever by his power, his eyes watch and here's the key here, the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Selah, and that just basically means stop and think about it, ponder it. So he rules over the affairs of nations. And you know, that's the dichotomy we live in. People think that uh, nations are in absolute control, but they are not. They're under the watchful eye of the Lord God Almighty. And then in Daniel 2, he changes times and seasons, deposes kings, and sets up kings. 
So there we have Kings. And he sets up kings. He's the one who puts people in power. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So even our mental capacities are gifts from God. So he rules over all nature, times and seasons right there. And he removes rulers. He establishes rulers. So, you know, people who have been saying, well, Donald Trump was called in to reign by God. Well, that's true. But also was Barack Obama. Also was George W. Bush. Also were the different kings throughout history. The rulers in England, Margaret Thatcher, good example. He put all of them in power for a reason, and then he removes them. Coffee break. Enjoy your virtual coffee. So he's over all of this. And then he rules over, he's the maker of all life and rules over it. As Psalm 139 says, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. God is active in all life. And he sustains life, as Paul points out in the book of Acts. And in Galatians 1.15, before I was born, this is Paul speaking, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. So God rules over human destiny. He rules over who we are and what we do. Um, just think of even today during this coronavirus. He's put us all here for a purpose. And we're all doing the things he wants us to do. And then in the first chapter of Luke, and this is in Mary's Magnificat, where she is praising God after vi the visitation by the angel Gabriel. And she said, he has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. So he rules over human successes and failures. He raises up, he brings down. And then Psalm 4, 8, in peace, I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. So he rules over the protection of his people and actually the protection of all people. Like I mentioned earlier, he, he rules with common grace. So this doctrine stands in direct opposition to the idea that the universe is governed by chance or fate, which is the backbone of evolution, chance and fate. And if you look at how things are put together, that makes no sense whatsoever. So in God's sovereignty, it takes into consideration the goodness of God and us as children of God. And this whole overarching activity is called God's providence. So through providence, God accomplishes his will. To ensure that his purposes are fulfilled, God governs the affairs of men and works through the natural order of things, the natural order which he set up. So the laws of nature are nothing more than God's work in the universe. The laws of nature have no inherent power in and of themselves. And this is something that we often miss. Rather, they are principles that God set in place to govern how things normally work. This is the basic activity of everything on earth. They are only laws because God decreed them. And so God put them into place. And here we are right in the middle, God's children, and we are all part of this great providential working that's going on.
Now, the question that always comes up is this attitude of free will of man and God's sovereignty. How does divine providence relate to human volition, which is actually a better word instead of free will, or you could even say free agency. We tend to call it free will, which is kind of an unfortunate connection because there's really not a whole lot free about it. So we know that humans have a free will, but we also know that God is sovereign. How those two truths relate to each other is hard for us to understand, but we see examples of both truths in scripture. Saul of Tarsus was willfully persecuting the church, and we all recall that. But all the while he was, it said in the book of Acts, kicking against the goads of God's providence. Note that Jesus even teaches both the sovereignty of God, the Son of Man will go as, as it has been decreed, he said, and the responsibility of man. Woe to that man who betrays. <laughs> we know who he was speaking of, Judas. So there's this fine balance in how God has made things. And it has to do with God's sovereignty along with man being responsible. So providence is taught in Romans 8, 28. We know that all in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So there you have calling, you have activity. And so all things means all things. God is never out of control. Satan can do his worst, yet even the evil that is tearing the world apart is working toward a greater final purpose. Now, often we can't see it yet, but we know that God allows things for a reason and that his plan is good. And that just makes me think of one of Martin Luther's favorite statements. He said, Satan is God's devil. And that basically means Satan is subordinate to God. He can only act when God allows. So we see this verse in Isaiah 26. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hmm, sounds like social distancing. People kind of think this is something new, but no, it's happened before in history. Hide yourselves for a little while until the fury has passed. For behold, the Lord is coming out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity and the earth will disclose the blood shed on it and no more cover its slain. Interesting. So this was back when um, Nebuchadnezzar was coming to overtake Israel and take them into captivity. So the doctrine of divine providence can be summarized this way. God, in eternity past, in the counsel of his own will, ordained everything that will happen. Yet in no sense is God the author of sin, nor is human responsibility removed. And that little phrase is taken from the early Westminster Confession and the London Baptist Confession. So the primary means by which God accomplishes his will is through secondary causes. And what are those? The laws of nature and human choice, uh, or as I stated earlier, human volition. Now this is an interesting thing. Jonathan Edwards did a deep study in all of this back in his work called The Freedom of the Will. And if anyone wants to take a gander at it, I have a copy right here. Hard read, but it's a great read. And as it states in one of the original um, publications of it, wherein are explained and fetated, well, this, this is the old English where S's were <laughs> made F's. So stated various terms and things belonging to the subject 
of the ensuing discourse, ensuing discourse. So um, Edwards jumped into that and dug it up. He said, I assert that nothing ever comes to pass without a cause. And this is also verifiable scientifically. Causes, secondary causes. There's always a mover when things are moving. So that's why I said, in essence, our will isn't necessarily free because it's governed by all things around us. And science has even recognized this. Um, and it talks, uses this word volition. And it, it works in, in how we work and how we perform, what we do, participation, performance, skill, all these things work in harmony to create um, the environment in either which we work or exist. And uh, one of the terms they came up with, occupational adaptation. So you can find this in psychology and in sociology. But even science understands there's all these causes that work together to create things. And Max Planck, one of the, actually he was a um, evolutionist, but he said, this is one of man's oldest riddles. How can the independence of human volition be harmonized with the fact that we are integral parts of a universe which is subject to the rigid order of nature's laws. So even in evolutionary thought, they can't, they can't get away from this providence that is overarching human activity. So there are some who say that the concept of God directly or indirectly orchestrating all things destroys any possibility of free will. If God is in complete control, they say, how can we be truly free in the decisions we make? Well, in other words, for free will to be meaningful, there must be some things that lie outside of God's sovereign control. And that's what a lot of people try to infer and the contingency of human choice that's they just think that well if we don't have this freedom we aren't really making choices well let us assume for the sake of argument that this is true what then would be the result well if god is not in in complete control of all contingencies then how could he guarantee our salvation and so that's why, um, you know, the arguments throughout history in the church against God's sovereignty and man's choice have been so um, such fertile ground for fighting, I guess you could say. How can you balance that? Well, if that's true, then God cannot guarantee our salvation. God cannot put it into the category of perseverance, of, of the final victory of the saints. So if God is not in control of all things, then this promise here in Philippians 1.6, where Paul said, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. <laughs> there you have it. This promise would be false. It would be in doubt. So if future does not belong completely to God, we do not have complete security that our salvation will be made complete. So furthermore, if God is not in control of all things, then he is not sovereign. And he, if he is not sovereign, then he is not God. So the price of maintaining contingencies outside of God's control results in a belief, and here's the kicker, that God is not really God. And therefore, that's where atheism starts to ebb forth. It comes from people who were usually originally brought up in the church, but they fell victim to this thinking 
So if our free will can trump divine providence, then who ultimately is God? Well, we are. And see, that's what the people in the Armenian camp fail to realize. The whole reason why this comes up is that we want to be God. We want to be in control of all things. And our greatest example of that is Satan himself. It's we're wanting to say, I am God here. So this is why it's so important to have a biblical worldview. The conclusion of that whole previous train of thought is unacceptable to anyone who definitely does have a biblical worldview. Divine providence does not destroy our freedom or our volition or our free agency. Rather, divine providence takes our freedom into account and in the infinite wisdom of God sets a course to fulfill God's will. And this is seen so much in what we talk about as our faith in Christ. Well, in actuality, it's not our faith at all. So the Christian faith is in an absolutely rational creator the standard for all of life. And he is the origin. And there is a mystery involved. But actually, you can call the faith of the world, I tend to call it a finite faith, or you could call it an atheist faith. And the Christian God does not live in this faith. It's non-rational. It does not have an answer for morality, emotion, subject, it's totally subjective. So they try to appeal to reason, but where did they get their reason from? And they appeal to mystery, which is in our emotions. It doesn't follow through. Science, politics, you know, they try to make it look like it's objective, but it's totally subjective. So in essence, our faith is supernatural. You look at the world, everybody is operating with a finite faith. You get in a car, you turn it on, you start it up. What does that cause? It causes a bunch of explosions in the engine with very volatile fuel, gasoline. So you are really trusting, you really have faith that that car isn't going to just blow up and kill you. <laughs> and the big one is people go into restaurants all the time. That requires faith. Why? Well, you don't see what's going on back in the kitchen when your food's being prepared. Supernatural faith is the Christian faith, which in reality comes from Christ. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And here's the key, the author and finisher of our faith. So that word author, archegos, founder or leader, and it's a noun in the Greek, it means originator, author, founder, prince, or even leader. Well, Christ is all of those things. So that's why this is a very rich Greek word. Christ is our preeminent example. He originated our faith and carried it through to perfect completion. In doing so, he is experiencing the joy of accomplishment and the exaltation of the Father's will in all things. So he indeed is the author and finisher of our faith, and he has graciously given that faith to us. He has passed it on to us, and we follow the example of his faith as he lived out a perfect life on this earth. 
So God's perfect plan is seen in what we are just coming into. And that is this whole season of the Easter story. This whole week leading up to Easter, to Good Friday, to Resurrection Sunday, and today is Palm Sunday. You look at it closely and you see how God orchestrated the whole thing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's all I can say. He is in control and we will see it throughout this week in the Easter story. And I'll try to point out a few of those things in our next um, online visits here. So let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. You have given it to us. So as a gift, it is ours. We receive it gladly. But it has nothing to do with what we have done. So Lord, we thank you and praise you and be with us as we venture through all that you did this week, starting today with Palm Sunday, as you cast out the money changers, as you taught, as you were called um, into question by the religious leaders of your day, as you established the new covenant in the, in the well, I would like to say the first supper of the new covenant. We will look at all of this and your death on the cross and your resurrection. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So goodbye until next time. May God bless you and keep you.